Um, thank you all for coming. My name is John Torpy. I'm oh, director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies, um, and working hand in glove with uh, Patricia Nova of the European Union Studies Center. And it's my great pleasure this afternoon to uh, welcome you to this event uh, titled provocatively, as I was just informed, No New Gestapo, uh, Legacies of Nazism in the German Office for the Protection of the Constitution which is the title of a book that will be forthcoming very soon by our two authors, uh, Konstantin Goschler and Michael Bala of the Ruhr Universität Bochum. I <coughs> have a, a comment from uh, our CUNY colleague, uh, uh, Benjamin Head, from the Department of History at Hunter College and right here at the Graduate Center. Konstantin Goschler I've known for a long time uh, due to a common interest in the subject of uh, the idea of reparations for its terrible injustices, about which I wrote a book some years ago, looking at a number of cases, but uh, not really the Nazi ones, specifically uh, the German case, uh, whereas Professor Goschler has uh, written very, very extensively about the implementation of the uh, post World War II reparations programs. Um, you see uh, from the invitation here that he's co editor. Called Robbery and Restitution, the Conflict Over Jewish Property in Europe, which is just one of many, many publications, but that's one that's available in, in English. Uh, the co-author, Michel Bala, is professor of North American history at uh, the Ruhr University, and his research focuses on intelligence and security issues, uh, American images of the world, American-German relations, and they're here today because uh, we have embarked on a, an attempt to put together a transatlantic seminar for graduate students, so 10 German students will come over this coming summer uh, and join 10 American students here at the Graduate Center in discussions about their research, and uh, then we'll reverse the process a year from now and send 10 of our students, the, the, the same 10 students, back to, uh, or over to Boulogne. And uh, we hope we will stimulate some of the kind of transatlantic cooperation of which I certainly myself have been a tremendous beneficiary. I've often said that I really wouldn't have had a career without the German taxpayer. Uh, so on that note, let me turn it over to, uh, I guess, Professor Boschler is going to go first. Professor Bala is going to begin. So please uh, join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Testing one, two. Is it on? It's on, but uh, well, I think I, I, have have a, speak. I have a pretty loud voice, so you know, yeah. is it, can everyone hear me? Yes. I guess. I mean, the issue is for the recording, but okay, I can. Uh, it's off. In, in one of the lecture halls where you have 120 people sitting, I usually kind of address. Can the people in the back rows can actually hear me most of the time? So if I have to speak up, do let me know. Um, the book that uh, John Torpy, Professor Torpy, mentioned. Is actually the result of a three-year research project that we just completed in last in the last year in November. <clears throat> three years of going into the files of the Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz, the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution in Germany, and looking specifically at uh, former members of the NSDAP, the Nazi Party, the SS, Gestapo, and the Sicherheitsdienst of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, Hauptamt Hitler's outfit, uh, and if they had any impact or influence on that Verfassungsschutz, if they were basically brown roots uh, to the Verfassungsschutz. Uh, and we completed that project, and uh, the book is not out yet. It will be out, published by Rowald Verlag. You are all invited to buy it. It is in German, though. But, you know, there's always language courses available for someone who doesn't speak German yet. Um, <clears throat> The Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution, the Verfassungsschutz, was shaped not only as an important component of the national security triad, Verfassungsschutz, Federal Police, and later Germany's external intelligence organization, the BND. It was also an essential and integral part of a transatlantic security system established by the Western Allies in the early Cold War. 
charged with collecting information on subversive activities, but explicit, explicitly without executive powers. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was to be run by the German government and the German authorities, even while the Federal Republic was still governed by the statute of occupation. Confidence in the German political class, however, was still pretty weak four years after World War II, and the Allies seemed to have feared that their own creation might prove to be unmanageable. Thus, preventing this new intelligence organization to become a new Gestapo was their guiding principle from the very beginning. Quote, this German authority, the American intelligence director of the Allied High Commission stated, is one of the most sensitive and most delicate problems we face. Extensive mechanisms of control were installed to harness an agency was, that was supposed to detect and control communist subversive infiltration of German society and the political system. This double containment shaped structure, organization, and tasks much more than German national interests did and is particularly obvious in the selection of personnel. Every single job applicant for the federal office until 1955 was checked by the high commissioners, who either approved or denied hiring. Additionally, the United States in particular extensively penetrated the federal office through clandestine means. An army counterintelligence CIC uh, agent established close personal relationships with the Verfassungsschutz first president Otto Jun, and the CIA controlled organization Gielen, the predecessor of the BND, uh, had to provide copies of the entire correspondence with the federal office, including teleprinter messages, without the Verfassungsschutz actually knowing about this. Despite the distinct and articulated Allied interest in setting up the federal office, it took almost nine months before Witter von Lex, the Ministry of the Interior, under secretary, entered into extensive and in-depth negotiations. The Allies made clear from the very beginning that they did not want former members of the Gestapo, the SS, or Himmler's Security Service, the SD, uh, to work at the Verfassungsschutz. Former counterintelligence Abwehr personnel could be used sparingly, but only if they had never worked against France. The Verfassungsschutz should not rise from brown roots to use this uh, metaphor that is part of the recent public discourse uh, on the usefulness and dangers of intelligence organizations in Germany. When in early May 1950, the governing law, the law governing the Verfassungsschutz was submitted to the German parliament, von Lex announced, quote, the federal office will be staffed only with democratically absolutely reliable personnel. How then people with sufficient experience in the field of poli political police, and this is what the Verfassungs actually, Verfassungsschutz actually was to be, should be found remain unclear. Most officers in the criminal police who had adequate field experience had become members of the SS. The federal officer's tasks were only vaguely defined as collecting information, what means covert or just overt, but to be employed to collect, process, analyze, and disseminate intelligence was not defined. The entire technical equipment of the Verfassungsschutz consisted of 15 typewriters. That was it. However, for the purpose of protecting the Constitution, additional 3 million marks were earmarked in the federal, uh, federal budget for 1950. 3 million marks, that is five times the entire salary of the official staff. The high hurdles for hiring people made it difficult to find qualified people. Of more than 1,500 job applicants in the period between 1950 and 1952, only 88 were employed. Former police officers joined the rebuilt federal police, the Bundeskriminalamt, without prejudice to that past. Not surprisingly then, 70% of the higher echelons of the Bundeskriminalamt were former SS members. The personnel selection problem became particularly apparent when it came to finding someone to, for the exposed position of president of the Verfassungsschutz. Reinhard Gielen was the first of these candidates, supported by Chancellor Adenauer. 
Being as president would have been acceptable to the Americans, but even as a vice president, he could not be pushed through against uh, strong British and French resistance. Candidate after candidate fell through until finally, Allies and Germans could agree on Otto Jorn. He had been brought into play reluctantly by a meanwhile unnerved German officials over the protest of old German, uh, Wehrmacht generals. Jorn had been connected with the failed coup of 20 July 1944, fled to Great Britain, and now in 1950 was jockeying for a position in Germany. He had no previous experience in the field of intelligence and actually had hoped for a job with the foreign office or with Lufthansa. He was, to put it bluntly, the ninth choice. When he took up his new job in December 1950, more than nine months had elapsed since the first candidates had been discussed in the press. It is hard to imagine a worse start for the Verfassungsschutz. Too few staff, only a few former counterintelligence people, no clear outline of tasks and methods, and a president damaged even before he taking office. It was ambitious amateurs, such as Günther Nollau, later to become president, that made up the initial staff. Long list of over 60 intelligence organizations, political parties, groups covering the entire political spectrum of the young federal republic was drawn up. But how they were to be researched and analyzed with only 80 people at the first start, 80 employees remain unclear. Not surprisingly, Otto Jones annual reports are a constant complaint about too little staff. In the meanwhile, uh, the Chancellor's Office had made use of the Agile Deal and his organization, as well as other intelligence organizations competing with the Federal Office, and the Verfassungsschutz was increasingly marginalized. Its superior authority, the Interior Ministry, was hardly interested in what they did, and a CIA assessment proclaimed that the Verfassungsschutz was often misused as a dumping ground for incompetent employees and troublemakers. In this trying situation, Otto Jung almost desperately hoped to create an esprit de corps. The federal office was to prevent Germany from, quote, again being raped by a regime of violence and terror, he told the staff in 1953, and that they, quote, would be the first to be hanged or put in concentration camps if that happened. By that time, however, the federal office had already slipped from his fingers. The department rearranged their structures, their structures, created new subdivisions and posts without bothering to inform the head office. In 1956, a commission found that the Hyde Office had no sufficient knowledge of the internal structure of the Verfassungsschutz and could not even tell who was on the sick list. <coughs> the busy Nollau worked past his department's head to increase his own influence and importance, and Richard Gielen, head of the Department uh, 2 collection from 1952 on, built his own independent organization within the Federal Office, completely with parallel structures and personnel management. It is here in this department that the Verfassungsschutz most visibly deviated from the Allies' prime directive that no Gestapo and SS members should become guardians of West Germany's constitution and its democratic political system. This was possible because Gierken had almost unchecked oversight over a large part of the vaguely declared three million German marks earmarked for protection of the constitution. Gehl had been in counterintelligence before 1945 and began his post-war career in North Rhine-Westphalia in that office for the protection of the Constitution. Fired there because he had concealed his early membership in the NSDF. He was supported by the British to find employment in a similar lender office in Lower Saxony. It is not quite clear if Gehrken was actually a paid British agent. But his files in the British National Archives state, quote, that he had been repeatedly supported financially in a number of personal crises. When Otto Jorn asked the British if Gierken could be allowed to transfer to the federal office, they eagerly consented. He promised to serve as a counterweight to the almost paramount American influence. Giel rebuilt the department, created new units, and presumptuously reported to Jorn the new structure works, it will be maintained. 
Gierken focused on counterintelligence, and Vice President Radke, also an old counterintelligence man, and the Chief Gielen Mohl in the Verfassungsschutz, supported him. Otto Jon hovered about the office and gave Gierken pretty much the free reign because he soon improved the Verfassungsschutz's reputations in the eyes of the German authorities by uncovering Czech intelligence agents. Gierken was obviously convinced that he could not could not do without alleged experts among former Gestapo and SS members and hired a large member, number of them as free employees, as freelancers, people never screened by the Allies. Of the 67 freelancers that we could, could identify in the very, very scanned personnel records, at least 20 were formerly with Gestapo and SS, five had belonged to the SD of Hitler's Reichsheitshaus. This is more than a third. By comparison, among the official staff in 1955, about, of about 200, only two were members of SS at this time, a mere 1%. Among the freelancers were individuals such as Otto, Erich Otto Wenger, who had become a member of the NSDAP in 1st of May 1932. A little later, he entered the SR, and on March, in 1st of March 1933, the SS. Until 1935, he was a member of the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler before joining the Gestapo. He later worked for the German Embassy in Paris, Passport Department, and during August and September 1944, led a so called anti guerilla unit in the Vosges. He was regarded by the CAA as Gierken's most important man. Walter Odewald is a similar case. In 1935, he was chief criminal police in Hanover, incidentally an undercover agent for the SD in that outfit, a member of the SS in 1937, and he had become a member uh, of the NSDAP in the same year, but only because his uh, application of 1932 had been lost. In the fall of 1941, he went to Paris, where he was responsible for curtailing the black market, in mid-December 44, we find him as head of the Criminal Investigation Department in Prague. As could be expected, his job application was rejected by the Allies. This stuff did not prevent him, however, from being put in charge of the Verfassungsschutz chapter in Hanover as a freelancer. Similar CVs can be found in the Verfassungsschutz chapter in Hamburg, headed by Paul Opitz, a member of the Gestapo and SS Sturmbannführer, not surprisingly, he also was a freelancer. The pattern of putting former Gestapo and SS member at the head of these outposts, removed from immediate allied scrutiny, is obvious, and is, and is not, it is no surprise that these outposts were controlled by Gierken. Although the Ministry of the Interior and U.S. intelligence agencies know, knew about most of these people, they were unaware of some of the details of them. This was, for example, the case with Gustav Barstow, who in 1942 had tortured a Norwegian resistance fighter, Brynhild Strom, until she had died. But it is also pretty obvious that they looked the other way, because these former Gestapo and SS members delivered what both wanted, success in counterintelligence. Counterintelligence. Counterintelligence became somewhat of a raison d'etre of the federal office, and Gierken was given almost carte blanche to build up an even larger staff of freelancers, some of whom worked under cover names at the Cologne headquarters and were paid according to the pay scale <coughs> of the official members. Wenger became Wolters, Johannes Strübing became Hans Stahlmann. Obersturmführer Strübing even continued what he had done during the Nazi period as a member of the Special Commission Red Orchestra, when the intelligence services of the United States, Britain, Netherlands, Switzerland, and France began chasing supposed remnants of that organization after 1945. Among these, these semi-official freelancers, Strübing repeatedly came to the attention of authorities, federal prosecutors and federal police alike, because he did not seem to care all that much about the confines of the rules of law. He had, for example, begun an intelligence game with a possible still active Czech agent. That letter boxes were installed, loaded with fake documents, but the person targeted did not bite. Finally, 
Ströbing handed the case over to the security group of the Federal Criminal Police Office in Bonn, who was responsible for arrests in these cases because the Verfassungsschutz did not have executive power to do that. In court, the prosecutors soon uncovered that the, that the supposed secret documents proving that the woman was a Czech agent had never been touched by her, and that on top were fabricated by the Verfassungsschutz. A Czech handler, it turned out, was an undercover agent of the federal office. Strübing in his report had lied about all this. Federal prosecutors were up in arms accusing Otto Jon of allowing Gierken uncontrolled headhunting and employing old Gestapo and Esmin, who strikingly often appeared as witnesses in court. The scathing demarche was seconded by the protest of American intelligence services. Strübing's position as a freelancer protected him from disciplinary action, and he was, deemed too too, he was deemed to be too valuable to be fired. Someone else served as a scapegoat uh, and was demoted in that case. Until the statute of occupation ended in Germany, Strübing and his likes were officially kept out of the Verfassungsschutz. This changed after 1955 because the German social security system and its rule oblivious to allied recruitment policy forced the Verfassungsschutz to either employ the freelancers officially, to have them participate in unemployment and retirement insurance and have them pay taxes, or let them go. Thus a fake company was set up, headed by former Gestapo and SS member Gustav Halsbeck, that then hired the freelancers. This document research company was dissolved only after a detailed investigation of personnel and structure of the federal office in 56 revealed alarming organizational problems. Subsequent restructuring gave Gierken his own counterintelligence department, but also robbed him of his little empire of freelancers and access to the millions of German marks that had fed the system. The fake company was dissolved, and with the strict allied hiring policies being disbanded, the way it was cleared for incorporating Gestapo and SS man went in the Verfassungsschutz. Of the 21 Halswick employees that made it into the federal office, 13 were former members of the criminal Nazi organizations Gestapo and SS. Three, including Halswick and Erich Wenger, by 1936, 63, excuse me, had become senior civil servant, Regierungsräte, Arbeitsrat, Strübing was Regierungshauptmann. The others did not receive the coveted status of Beamter that gave ultimate job security, but remained clerks, angestellt. Two in the higher brackets, uh, BAT 3 uh, and BAT 4 and 5. The former Dutch chief of police of Eindhoven, Hauptsturmführer Johannes Petrus Koymans, who had found refuge in the Verfassungsschutz chapter in Hamburg, interestingly enough, never made it past the pretty low grade, a uh, low grade pay grade of the RT7. All of them had finally arrived at protected positions, respected by their colleagues except as successful experts in a profession in which they could make use of their experience before 1945 and after. Feeling safe, they had no clue that a scan book only a few years later would cast their past into the limelight of political and public discourse. By 1967, the very last of them had been removed from, uh, from the Verfassungsschutz. The number of Gestapo and SS officials working in the Verfassungsschutz was, was compared with the federal police, BND, and the German parliaments, never very large, just 16 out of 700 in 1960. However, as guardians of West Germany's constitution, its democratic political system, they were ill-equipped. We did not actually find Nazi jargon in, in the documents that we looked at in the files. The guarded language of their reports reads more like police reports. The action, however, however, often speak a different story. They adapted to the new political system as they had adapted to the Nazi regime. And it, might well be true for the lot of them what British interrogators had to say about Gierken in 1947. Quote, he is an anti-communist at heart, but were the Russians to enter this zone, he would no doubt become an ardent promoter of communism. Now, 
They protected the state and the Adenauer government. And this, to them, the confines of law and actually the German constitution often seem to be of secondary importance. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, due to time, I try to shorten my presentation a little bit. So, uh, in a way, in the last few years, uh, there has been an, an obsession in the German public with uh, the role of former Nazis in uh, German administration and uh, the Verfassungsschutz is a special, uh, important example for this. So this is a typical caricature. Uh, I, I could have taken uh, dozens of other ones. Um, you, you can see Hale uh, const, uh, Constitution, and then uh, in the middle you see Adolf Hitler, and written over him, uh, uh, informant of the month, confidential informant of the month, and then uh, on the left-hand side somebody uh, showing uh, the Hitler greeting, and uh, then you can read NPD remains, uh, duty remains, jobs remain, and so on, and so on. So uh, the message is um, basically the task of uh, the foreign administration um, for the protection of the constitution is to protect Nazis, and this is due to the existence of former ex-Nazis or neo-Nazis in uh, this administration. So this is the, uh, the, the general perception or a very uh, collective perception of this administration. And I just want to make some remarks about uh, the coming in, the creation of this image and uh, some findings of our projects. So, um, Public image is that there is a blindness on the right eye, so they are always looking on communists, but they don't look for Nazis. And uh, at the same time, there is a, a fe there are fears of the surveillance state, and these two um, elements of the public uh, image uh, were both very dominant or came into uh, existence during the era on which I'm talking about, uh, the era since the late 1950s until the 1970s. Um, in, during this time, uh, there emerged an important change of uh, the role of this uh, office. Uh, in, former, in, in the earlier times, th uh, the main task was to, to hunt for communists, so this was these were the times of the good old Cold War, when the world was very easily conceived. So on the one side the Russians, on the one side uh, the West, and uh, we had to protect ourselves uh, for, uh, before... Uh, we had to protect against uh, the communists and against uh, Soviet tank armies. And uh, since the late 1960s, the world became much more complex. In a way, it re reminds us much more to our present time. So there was no longer this uh, bipolar world order, but now uh, emerged new threats. Uh, the threat of, uh, I'm speaking from the German perspective, the threat of foreigners, the threat of uh, terrorists, the threat of um, uh, so-called sympathizers, and so on, and so on. So uh, the, the world of this office very much changed. I'm talking about perceptions. It's always a problem whether we are talking of perceptions of we, or if we are talking about changes in the real world. And of course, both have to do something with each other. But uh, our point of view is that we want to analyze how the world was conceived, how it was perceived, in this administration. And this is my first point. The world very much changed within uh, the realm of this institution. And our question, or my question is, uh, how did the source code of the federal office, which already was mentioned by my uh, <coughs> colleague, no more Gestapo, did change during this time? What happened since the late 1950s? And I'm only shortly briefly mentioning the structural develop developments in this era. So I already was talking about changing perception of dangers. Uh, 
which also implied an expansion expansion of tasks. So they had much more to do, and expansion of task always means expansion of personnel. So this was really dramatic. So they they started in the early 1950s with some dozen uh, um, uh, employees, and until uh, 1970s there were about 2,000. And so there was uh, one commentator at that time who wrote, uh, mathematicians would be able uh, to calculate when uh, uh, all of the public servants of the Federal Republic will consist of Verfassungsschützer uh, uh, and even uh, the whole population of the Federal Republic will uh, consist of Verfassungsschützer uh, because the rise was so dramatic. And uh, another element which is important for this time is the expansion of data collection. So they started with uh, file cards in the early 1960s. Uh, they changed to, to punch cards. And uh, are, are about 1970s, they started with modern computerization, which implied uh, all the technological possibilities which uh, are still uh, troubling in our times. So, uh, this is important for also for the public perception because suddenly a, a new uh, the, uh, the, uh, the office the federal office not only changed itself uh, uh, the perception of threats but the public also changed their perception of the office as a threat to uh, liberal uh, to a liberal society so these this is the dialectics of this era um, Again, also very briefly, uh, some remarks to uh, the federal office as an object of scandals, which, uh, as you will see, reminds very much to the public image, which uh, still is valid. And uh, my point would be that uh, uh, the public image, which we have today, of this image, or which is very uh, common today, origins in this uh, period of time because the two main elements of the uh, current public image uh, come up during this time and these two elements as i said before are uh, blindness on the right uh, on the right eye and uh, big brother on the other hand so uh, as a um, consequence of computerization uh, and what we did in our project is that we tried to avoid what uh, very often happens, that uh, we didn't, did not want to repeat uh, uh, the contemporary history of scandals, but rather we wanted to write a history of the making of scandals. So a scandal, in our perspective, is not just uh, something uh, which, immediately, which directly reflects some wrongdoing of somebody, rather uh, in a... Uh, media historian perspective, a scandal will be the result of a process where somebody argues in public um, uh, with uh, the wrongdoing of somebody and uh, it also uh, implies that somebody refers to a publicly accepted norm. So only when these integrants come together, a scandal will emerge. And we can um, uh, make a distinction between the primary scandal and the secondary scandal. So the primary scandal normally uh, in political life will be that somebody discovers or makes public uh, some wrongdoing of some official and the secondary scandal will be, uh, will result from uh, the fact that somebody who is accused in public that he has of wrongdoing and he will say, uh, refu refuse to accept uh, um, this accusation, and when he afterwards will will be uh, when afterwards will be shown that uh, he has lied, then there will be a secondary scandal. So think to the Levinsky scandal. Uh, the, uh, the the actual scandal was that he had lied about what he had done and not what he actually had done in in the office. So this is the distinction. And this is something which we very often can uh, perceive when we look at these uh, Nazi scandals. And we can see that there were two waves of Nazi topic related scandals. The first wave was uh, since the end of the 1950s, where there were accusations that there uh, were former SS men and Gestapo men working at the federal office. And uh, 
these uh, scandals were combined with another scandal uh, because at that time the, uh, there was publicly debated that uh, the German federal office worked together with the allies in uh, wiretapping. And the problem was that for the Germans, wiretapping was illegal, while for the allies, it was not illegal. They were allowed to do so. And the accusation was that the Germans used uh, uh, the allied right to do something which they themselves were not allowed to do, uh, so that they uh, actually could wiretapping against uh, uh, the Constitution, which was a very uh, s severe uh, matter. And the problem was that SS men were contributing to this task, and so this made it uh, very problematic. So uh, y you could make things more, looking more dramatic if you could say it's, it's not just a wrongdoing, it's not just a breach of the uh, Constitution, but they're even, it's even worse former SS men are contributing uh, in the ranks of the uh, Verfassungsschutz to, uh, to a breach of constitution. And uh, in 1972 there were uh, different scandals against, uh, which also were related to the Nazi past in, in, of, in uh, this time of, of the chiefs of the federal administration. And uh, the question is, how we can explain the dynamics of these scandals and what do they tell us about the role in the federal agency in the German political system. Um, I only want to, to, make, to, to conclude and not to uh, explain those scandals in detail, but what we can see is uh, that Nazi scandals are always used to hit on different uh, problems. So they are they are used as a tool to uh, make appear other reproaches more dramatic. So in the first wave of scandals, it was a controversy on the powers of the federal office. What should the federal office be allowed to do? And the first problem was that. Uh, uh, they were due to a separation of intelligence and of police, so it's different to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the FBI. Uh, they have both uh, the rights of uh, intelligence and police. Uh, to, they, they carry weapons, and uh, those guys were not allowed to carry weapons, and they were not uh, allowed to arrest somebody. And this, uh, this was to make a clear distinction to the Gestapo. The uh, second problem was uh, whether they uh, were only applying surveillance to spies or also to ordinary citizens. And the third problem was that uh, there was always has always been a competition with the Bundesnachrichtendienst, uh, with, so uh, to make it easy, so with uh, with our CIA, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Agency, and uh, in all these conflicts. Uh, the role of former SS men was used to put pressure on uh, this, uh, on the foreign, on the, not the foreign office, on uh, the federal office. Um, okay, only shortly. As a, as a result of this scandal, there were were identified 16 persons which were uh, considered as unbearable, and this is uh, uh, the statistics which they made in the office. And only to explain shortly what uh, happened. Uh, the problem was not that they said, who are the Nazis, but the, uh, the point was that they said, uh, who are persons who are not, uh, who are prone to, <coughs> to, a scan, to a public scandal. And so they had to find criteria which uh, would make people inacceptable by the media and by the public. And so they were asking, well, what, what criteria might be feasible? So in the end they said, it's SS, it's Gestapo, uh, and it's uh, SD, but it's not, for example, party membership. So in the, early, in the early 1960s, former party membership was no problem. Only if somebody had uh, uh, participated uh, at a, a criminal organization like the SS and so on, then he was suspect. Uh, but 
the, the point was that uh, up to then, uh, only those people who had committed crimes were uh, uh, considered as unbearable uh, organizational. Uh, if somebody only had been a member of an organization, of a criminal or organization, uh, up to then this had not been considered as a problem. And so at that point, uh, public opinion shifted with respect to this. And uh, so uh, the uh, at that time they, they were not aware that uh, they had been, that they are, um, had come into existence a new public awareness of a new sensitivity. And this changed during the second wave of scandals because this time uh, the two then presidents, uh, Schwibbers and his uh, follower Nolau, uh, were scandalized because they had uh, been, uh, because the, uh, the former had been an um, a prosecutor, a state prosecutor during the Second World War and the latter had been a party member. This had not been a problem uh, 10 years earlier. So you can see that uh, uh, the definitions of who is a Nazi or who is considered as non-acceptable uh, did change during these times. And uh, these scandals were at the same time the result of these changes, but also uh, um, catalysts of these changes. Okay. Um, I will come to, uh, to a short discussion of, of these explanations. So first, the expansion of the federal office and the new complexity of perceived dangers uh, was an important background for the changing importance of the Nazi past. Second, the changing definitions of Nazi incrimination were very important with respect to this. Uh, we, could, we can uh, see a change from the so-called end of denazification to a constant expansion of the category of who uh, was considered as a Nazi. A third point would be um, that we have uh, to take into account a shift of the negative normative point of reference. So while it had, had been uh, the Gestapo uh, in the earlier time, now Big Brother, so the Orwell vision uh, became the new normative point of reference. And uh, in this time span, which I, I was debating, we can see this <coughs> shift uh, of reference, of, of the point of reference. And uh, fourth and last, uh, we can see a kind of paradox of the attempt of a structural distinction from the Gestapo. Because uh, what I explained, did explain to you was that uh, they, uh, there was uh, to, to get rid of the Nazi image, uh, the attempt to make a separation between uh, executive power and uh, the power of surveillance. But the consequence was that uh, this institution no longer did look at actions, but they did look at thoughts. And uh, at some point, uh, this uh, raised fears of surveillance, which were in their kind always also very uh, dangerous. And uh, so it, it might be considered as a paradox that as a result to, uh, of the attempts not to become like the Gestapo in the public um, image, uh, this institution became something which was considered as very dangerous in a different manner. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm going to be very brief. I just want to um, put forward perhaps three suggestions of points which I think emerge um, out of the really exciting research that Constantine and Michael have been doing. Um, and then we will uh, turn it over for discussion. I must say that um, I've been very excited about this project that these gentlemen are doing for several years since I first heard that uh, they had gotten the commission to do it. I've been very keen on uh, hearing about the results. So this is quite exciting for me, but I'm going to try and step back from my um, intelligence history geek persona. And the points I want to make are points which I think are 
uh, maybe ways in which we can think about what the importance is of this research that Constantine and Michel have been doing in a kind of broader <laughs> understanding of the post-war climate in Germany and indeed perhaps elsewhere. So the first thing I want to say is that I think this research um, has a really important bearing on how we think about uh, the political stability of West Germany in its earlier years, especially in the 19, uh, well, obviously the very late 1940s and the 1950s and into the early 1960s. We have a kind of tendency, I think, uh, even scholars to some extent who study this period, and certainly I think in the general public, we have a really sort of cheerful, happy view of the 1960s. You know, in America, we kind of think of it now as the happy days, 1950s, or the later end of the era, the late 50s into the early 60s, we might now think of as the Mad Men era. And it seems in many ways a kind of lost golden age. Um, and to some extent, um, historians of West Germany have a kind of version of this. And there, is a, there is a line of historiography on the Federal Republic which is a kind of triumphal historiography, which you know sort of celebrates the consolidation of democracy, and then eventually, of course, the fall of the wall and the reunification of the country. I th and uh, there is some debate in the historical literature about just at what point political stability came to the Federal Republic. For instance, um, uh, the late, very distinguished Tony Judd writes in his great book, Postwar, that political stability came very suddenly as water freezes into ice, and for West Germany, he says, this happened about 1953. Now, I want to venture the proposition that that is uh, to misunderstand a lot of the texture of the 1950s. And in fact, what, what certainly strikes me, and what I think emerges out of this project, when you actually look at the sources um, that record the experience of West Germans in the 1950s, what strikes the reader is the perception of people living through that time that, in fact, they were living in a deeply threatening, gloomy, profoundly unstable political era, and that this feeling seems to have lasted much later than we might retrospectively imagine. Uh, for instance, uh, I think one of the strongest examples of this is that uh, Konrad Adenauer, uh, in, uh, as late as 1958 in his Christmas address to the nation, uh, said, that most Germans then living had never experienced peace and stability, which I think is a rather remarkable thing to be saying in 1958, which we would probably today tend to think of as a kind of moving at least towards a kind of high water mark of the age of the economic miracle and so on. But this then gets to an important point about West Germany in the 1950s. There seemed to most Germans living through that era, I think, to be dangers on all sides. And many Germans worried about, on the one hand, the return of some kind of far-right uh, Nazi movement, and others, of course, worried about some kind of uh, communist subversion or indeed uh, a threat uh, from a Soviet or East German invasion uh, from the East. And these fears went right across the spectrum. I've seen examples of this, for instance, coming from uh, the Catholic socialist intellectual Eugen Kogon, who was the editor of a sort of hybrid period called the Frankfurt Hefte. And he wrote in 1954 that he felt that Democrats like himself uh, had their backs to the wall. That was literally the phrase that he used because of the sort of encroachment of Nazis again into the Adenauer administration. But from pretty much the other side of the spectrum, um, one of my uh, favorite ex-Nazis, a fellow named Rudolf Diels, who was the first chief of the Gestapo in 1933 and 1934, said more or less the same thing both publicly and in his private correspondence. He claimed, perhaps not incredibly believably, that he feared the return of Nazis. And he also uh, wrote to a friend uh, about 1954 that he thought, one day the Ivans will cash in our chattering democracy, i.e. the Russians will. Um, and I think if we sort of lose sight of this pervasive feeling of political instability and threat in the early years of the Federal Republic, then we lose a lot of the context in which um, the, the BFB is operating in its early years, that there's this wide, uh, deeply shared perception of these political dangers lurking out there from various kinds of political extremism. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is, um, I think, uh, I mean, the title of the project that Konstantin and Michel are, are doing is eloquent. Keine neue Gestapo, no new Gestapo. And it's very easy to understand why this fear would be abroad in the land in Germany uh, in the years after World War II. But I think the interesting thing to remember about the German context um, is that the uh, 
the sort of political fears in the political context, particularly with regard to something like a political police, was interestingly complicated in this era, because there was another strand running through here. There was a, a widespread feeling, and this tended to be on the liberal or the left side of the political spectrum, that what was needed uh, in the wake of the Third Reich, but also in the wake of the Weimar Republic, was what they called in German a Wehrhafte Demokratie, that is to say, to translate roughly, um, a democracy that is capable of defending itself. And there was a widespread feeling that the problem with Weimar was that it had been a democracy that could not defend itself, so that on thoroughly, you know, admirable democratic grounds, it's important to have something like the VFV precisely so that you don't get Nazi subversion <coughs> or other political extremist subversion of a democracy. Uh, you know, it, it's easy to see why people would fear a kind of encroaching Gestapo in the form of the VFV, but there's also a way to see it as a very important kind of democratic instrument, and it was seen that way by a good number of Germans at the time, notably by Otto Jung, the first president. Not particularly successful first president, but the first president um, of this particular institution. Um, in some of my own work, I came across an interesting reflection of this. I had the opportunity a few years ago to talk to a gentleman who uh, sadly has now passed away, a gentleman named Thomas Polger, who was a CIA officer. And as a young CIA officer in Germany in the uh, late 40s and early 50s, he actually participated in a kind of important American oversight role in the early years of the VFV. And when I interviewed him, he told me that one of his tasks had been to uh, get in touch with German Social Democrats, and particularly the great, in particular the great um, early post-war leader of the German Social Democrats, Kurt Schumacher, and talk with him about the BFV and make sure that the Social Democrats would buy into the idea. And uh, Mr. Polger told me he went and talked to Kurt Schumacher and explained the idea of the BFV, and Schumacher said, good, yes, do it. So there you have a kind of art Social Democrat manifesting this idea that something like the BFV was uh, necessary. Um, the last thing I want to say, and this really picks up on the last point that Constantine made, um, I, 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 I think a way to characterize the process Constantine talked about whereby in the earlier years the issue is identify men who were SS, SD, Gestapo, keep them out, but being a Nazi party member, no problem, there were after all 8 million of those, so it's hard to weed them all out of everything. Um, and somebody who was, say, a prosecutor under the Nazis and no doubt you know, prosecuted people for things we wouldn't altogether approve of, like Nolau. Well, that's okay, at least it's okay until the 70s. But then you see the sort of second wave of this where suddenly it's not okay to have been a prosecutor and it's not okay to have been a Nazi party member. Um, in other words, there's a kind of expansion of the categories of what is considered to be not okay or scandalous, as Constantine put it. And I would say this is actually part of a continuum which is continuing to this day where in analyzing this history in particular, we are more inclined now to think a little bit less in sort of formal categories of what could make a person sort of uh, suspicious or undesirable if they were employed by such an institution uh, in the 50s or 60s and sort of think more functionally about what kinds of things might they do, what kinds of belief structures might they have, which might not have much to do with whatever kind of formal affiliation uh, they might have had during the Nazi era. And uh, to explain a little bit what I mean by this, again, something I've noticed in some of my own work is that it was far from uncommon in West Germany in the 50s and, and certainly into the 60s to have people holding various kinds of uh, very important offices in many cases who would seem on paper to be absolutely politically impeccable Ex, ex or continuing social democrats and so on, no formal Nazi affiliation. And yet you find, often enough, they had actually done rather distressing things during the Nazi era, and in certain ways this manifested itself in some of what they did later on. Uh, for instance, um, Macri was for a long time the, uh, excuse me, the uh, 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 state prime minister of the state of Lower Saxony, uh, an, an impeccable social democrat in terms of formal affiliation. Turned out to have done various uh, dreadful things like uh, participated in the expropriation of Jewish businesses during the Nazi era and so on. And you might wonder just what sort of fearlessly um, democratic, um, balanced in terms of consideration of political extremes and so on such a person might run in their administrative capacity and you might be right to suspect that they might in fact uh, end up sheltering a lot of ex-Nazis and in institutions uh, like, for in this example, the state uh, version of the constitutional protection in Lower Saxony, you might find that they would do a lot to uh, suppress the bad records of police forces, 
employed by the state, you might find that they would be particularly aggressive in their prosecution of the Cold War. Um, and there might be a sort of quality to what they did that reflects, in some respects, perhaps a Nazi outlook, but would not be detectable by any formal criteria. And I think one thing that's happened in recent years is that we're a lot more likely to see this, to perceive uh, these kinds of records and these kinds of activities on the part of people who would not necessarily be detected by uh, you know, a search for people who only specifically had you know, SS or SD or Gestapo or even Nazi party records during the Nazi era. And I think that's one of the kind of interesting implications that sort of comes out of the verse that these gentlemen are doing. So that's pretty much all I have to say. I think it's time now to turn it over to discussion. Thank you very much. What respect that would things have, have been different? Um, there might have been less tolerance for allied um, uh, recruitment of former Nazis, and also this might have affected what happened within the German administration. Should I answer that? Um, I, I, I do not think that it would have made all that much different if all other things would have been the same. Because uh, Harry Truman or, or Eisenhower never knew about these things, uh, we know that we know that John J. McCloy knew about stuff like that. Uh, the High Commissioner knew about this. Uh, the CIA records are pretty much open uh, through the Nazi War Crimes Act's uh, disclosures, um, but it didn't go beyond that. These people up there had other stuff to do. It was on the groundwork, it was the officers of the CIA who dealed, dealt with these people of the Bundesamt uh, and, and in the very beginning the intelligence directors of the high commissioners and uh, there wasn't much difference to expect from Roosevelt uh, being tough on the Nazis, tougher on the Nazis than Harry did because they just didn't see that. That's not their job. Question, but okay, go ahead. Well, um, I mean, it, it's really raised by some of Ben's comments, I think, in particular. Um, and it's this question about, you know, the Wehrhafte Demokratie, the measures that a democracy, you know, may take in order to defend itself. I mean, there's an item in this morning's New York Times about uh, sort of convicting a guy in France for essentially statements that were, are now deemed to have been uh, you know, supportive of terrorism and that this is a part of a larger you know sort of legal effort on the part of the French state to uh, you know go after terrorists and uh, so I guess the question is you know how well do you think the Amtverfassungsschutz has done uh, in serving that goal which as you you know nicely point out Kurt Schumacher, you know a good social democrat like Kurt Schumacher uh, you know, right eye blind or or not, you know, thought was a good idea. Okay, um, your question involves several problems. So the first problem is that the idea of Wehrhafte ED implies a specific interpretation of uh, the end of the Weimar Republic. It implies an interpretation which says, well, the problem was that the constitution was too weak. Uh, and we need. Uh, but it's a general problem. I mean, yeah. It's a general problem. It's how do democracies defend themselves against yeah. people who don't believe in democracy. Yeah. Right. Okay, but uh, given that, uh, the second point was that, uh, the, or my second point is that uh, the federal office in, in the first years uh, mainly uh, was focused on attacks on 
on the state. So, the, the, and in so far, um, um, it the problem was that they had a kind of uh, illiberal idea of uh, the defense of constitution because they uh, developed a self-understanding that uh, the main object uh, <coughs> uh, of defense is uh, the state and not so much the society. And so the, the problem is uh, when, when we're talking about uh, these problems is always twofold. The one thing is um, who are the enemies and the other thing is what is the object of protection? And so there's a relation between these two elements. Mm -hmm. And my argument would be, if you look at the first 25 years or so of this history, you can see that this relation is changing because both uh, uh, the enemies and the perception of the enemies are changing and also the object uh, of protection is changing. And so far, uh, the answer to your question, to come back to that, is uh, more complicated because it depends from what do you consider as uh, um, the aim of this institution. So um, you have to take into account that uh, both the objects and the enemies changed and in so far the answer whether they did a good job or whether they didn't do a good job depends from uh, the definition of the, jo of the job and uh, this definition changed during this time. So what, what we can say is uh, that um, uh, the Federal Republic uh, and the Constitution was not overruled, but what we can say is whether it was due to the work of this institution. Um, so, okay. Well, we, I could add on to that by, by giving a couple of specific examples of, from the early period. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Otto Jon presidency of, of, of the Verfassungsschutz, uh, the Verfassungsschutz gave information to the Adenauer government uh, how to conduct their um, election campaigns because they gave them information of opposite parties and they gave them information about the, that this party, which is a neutralist organization by Josef Wien, for example, uh, is not a threat and it would be not a good idea for the Adenauer government to go out against them very scathingly and uh, attack that organization because they will only have like 5% voting potential. So they actually protected the Adenauer government. And uh, you f we find that very often in, uh, in files that uh, there was a, a threat perception that the SPD, the Social Democrats, would come into power. That was the threat. Mm -hmm. It was straight, it was state protection, mm -hmm. and it was Adenauer administration protection. That is not really what I would consider a wehrhafte Demokratie because it's not the democratic process that is protected, but it is a government and the state that is protected. You know, Oregon was someone who wanted to do positive constitution protection by establishing organizations, youth organizations, in that very, very situation in the 50s and the 60s. He wasn't in, in office in the 60s anymore, but in that a situation where the whole political system in Germany was, there was a constitution, but how would that work? How would it play out? Uh, what is actually going on? What groups are kind of getting together? Do they get some kind of impact on society, on the political system? And that goes well into the 60s, I agree completely with you. Let me add something. So in, in the first two decades or so, as, as the main <coughs> danger um, was considered Soviet spies. And then suddenly the, the picture changed. No longer Soviet spies were the main danger, but uh, the danger became more complex. And uh, uh, as I said before, terrorists, sympathizers of ter terrorists, foreigners going back and forth. So uh, it be, uh, the picture became much more transnational. And, and at the same time, it was no longer the idea that uh, you need to protect the state and the society, but the society itself became a potential danger. So. And uh, at the, uh, and this change also implied that the answer to the question whether, whether uh, the, this institution did a good job or not uh, also changed because during the first two decades it was also always considered okay uh, they uh, basically they do a good job when it goes for uh, Soviet spies and this was also the core of their self image they said we are the bulwark, bulwark against Soviet spies and. Uh, this they told to the public again and again. 
when it came to looking for dangers coming from uh, the inside of the society, it became much more problematic because suddenly they looked for uh, for teachers and so on and so on if they might become a danger for uh, this, uh, the constitution, so called radical alas, so. Uh, rule against potential radicals uh, uh, be becoming public servants, which was a, 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 a huge debate. So just to, to point out uh, how complicated became the answer, uh, whether they did a good job or not. So you, you can see how, how the changes of the role uh, also implied different answers to this question. And this is a discussion that even takes place within the Bundesamt and within the lenders, individual state uh, offices of see that, you know, reconsidering the role rules. I was wondering if you could add a few words to the role of the allies in this, and both in, the, in terms of the inner workings and the uh, public perception. I was interested by what you said about the, uh, the first wave of Nazi scandals. There was sort of an interplay between, oh my god, there are Nazis there, but also um, the allies are helping circumvent the constitution or workings in a way which seems to sort of play into more nationalist discourses of fear of um, fear of foreign powers uh, sort of conspiring. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong here. But then on the other hand, when, when we hear about the Kochumaka story, it seems to be a much more constructive role behind the scenes. Is, is that what is going on or um, what is the... What is the balance between public perception and what actually went on? Allies. Okay. Well, uh, the, the, the <coughs> this changes over the time. So, as, as uh, Michael said before, in, in the early times, uh, the Allies were very uh, strictly trying to keep uh, Nazis out of the office. But uh, since the 1950s, they were no, no longer in charge of that. And at that time, they developed a very uh, a kind of, of partnership, which never until today has become <coughs> equal, but uh, some kind of partnership. And at that time, uh, they became very, let's say, pragmatic uh, when it came to those uh, people who were the object of scandal. So there was one point when they just planned uh, the invitation to Langley uh, of uh, one of uh, those guys who was later uh, the main scandalized person and they wanted to bring him uh, to Langley to the CIA headquarters because he was the most important, uh, uh, he was in charge of uh, the, the anti spionage uh, department. And uh, then the scandal started and at that time this uh, uh, the question was, will we bring him to the United States or not? And then uh, the CIA said, well, the scandal won't be so bad. And when this guy said to the CIA, well, better I, I won't go to, uh, to, uh, to Langley because this, won't, uh, have ne this may have negative effects to uh, my colleagues and uh, maybe my, my past is a problem for you. Uh, the CIA told him, well, we know everything about your past. This is not a problem. We are not only interested in what you are doing now. But this was in, um, uh, in the early 1960s. But the point is, they always had a look at uh, how these people developed, and they had a very cynical perspective. So you can find uh, judgments like, well, he's no longer uh, believe he no longer believes in Hitler, and so on, and so on. He has uh, he has only his career in mind, and is is he a danger or is he useful? And there were other people where, where they said, okay. If, uh, if the Russians will uh, conquer uh, this country, uh, then he will support the Russians. Uh, as long as we are here, he will support us. So they were so judging... It's not a political lens, but more trade craft. Uh, yeah, in terms yeah of exactly. Mm -hmm. Professionals, you mm -hmm. know. So you can give many That's examples for that, but I hope this makes the, uh, the basic line uh, clear. And, and, so it's and the public, was it a widespread... Um, was there much debate about the um, American or British influence on this? No, this was not publicly debated. Uh, the, uh, there, was, there was one um, interesting example which 
uh, very much reminds me to current developments when, when it comes to the role of the NS, uh, NSA uh, in, in Germany. Um, when, so when uh, the, uh, 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 the corporation uh, in, in, at wiretapping between Germans and Americans was pu publicly debated, uh, the Germans asked the Allies that they will give a, a public declaration, a statement which would help the Germans. And then they were totally furious and said, it, uh, you may not publicly uh, uh, debate what we are doing here. And th the same thing happened some weeks ago uh, when uh, uh, there was a German parliament commission and they wanted to uh, to inquire some uh, intelligent German intelligence officers about uh, their actual collaboration with the British uh, <coughs> intelligence, and then the British said, well, "When when you will do this, we will give we will provide you no further information." So this is the deal. Yeah? No public uh, discussion uh, what about our business, and this has been a line uh, since. Uh, since 1945 until today. I think we have time for just one more. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about uh, the role or possible role of uh, the East Germans uh, in all of this, um, because from uh, the work that I'm most familiar with, uh, this first set of scandals uh, in the late 50s also coincided with the East German propaganda campaign exposing um, Nazis in, or former Nazis in the uh, West German government, uh, such as Glocke and the, pop and the publication of the uh, Braunbuch. Um, as far as I know, this was very instrumental in leading to the new wave of prosecutions uh, starting in the late 50s against uh, former Nazi criminals. Um, so the question is to what extent, if any, because I don't know, um, that was this also a factor here? Were any of these uh, 16 names uh, in the Brown Book, for example. So there were some of them in the Brown Book, but the interesting thing is that uh, uh, the way how one dealt with the, the, with the Brown Book and all these uh, d uh, disclosures from the East changed over the time. When in the 1950s or 1960s somebody was accused by the by the East, everybody would say, "This is Eastern propaganda. We don't find propaganda. We don't look at right that. Find, look, here, look at here. This is this is an Eastern German uh, propaganda newspaper. Yeah, ah, and you can you, you, we found it in the files, and you can read on the arm, uh, find propaganda, enemy propaganda. What what does she, what does she represent? She, she's, she's just the cover. She's, she's clearly she's subversive. Cover. Okay, <laughs> clearly subversive. Okay, uh, and in 1972, Schröbers was killed uh, by the same material because uh, the, the, the Stasi had an own um, uh, uh, branch which was in charge of collecting uh, accusation material against West Germans, and uh, they had collected material for years against Schröbers. And they provided this material to a West German journalist, and he went to the then uh, German uh, Minister of the Interior, uh, Genscher, and showed him this material. And Genscher knew that this is Stasi material, but he wanted to get rid of Schröbers, and so he used Stasi material. And so at that time, it was no longer a problem. And Schröbers defended himself and said, how can you kill me with uh, Stasi material? And uh, Genscher told him, I don't care. <laughs> So, the, so the, uh, beyond the anecdotal value of the story, the systematic value is that the use of this material changed over the time. Yeah. Yeah. The perception of it was perceived as fine propaganda in the beginning. Nobody really believed it all that much or didn't care that much, and later on it became valuable. But the Stasi actually operated against the Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz. They had a mole in, in the Verfassungsschutz pretty high up. Uh, as a secretary, but uh, material. And they always tried to find information about who's actually working there, because the Verfassungsschutz didn't say who was working in, in, uh, in their offices, you know. So there was always the attempt to find out more about these people or who these people actually were who worked for the federal office. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our speakers today.